Thank you very much, Jim, and uh, um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it's indeed my honor and pleasure to be here, and thank you, uh, Francois and Jim in particular, uh, for having me. And uh, this time I'm asked to, uh, uh, I've been asked to make comments in Japan, South Korea, and the European Union. Uh, but in this session, I'm going to do so on Japan and South Korea chapter by Erin. And that said, I started uh, studying international migration uh, in the realm of international political cooperation. And I'm basically uh, taking the European Union as a case. Mm -hmm. So I have just started to study on Japanese case uh, with a comparative political perspective, and I haven't yet worked in Korea by myself. So I'll make it more of a commentary for uh, Erin's analysis on Japan, but more questions uh, to Koreans a uh, study of hers. So I hope it will be acceptable to you and uh, all of the audience. Anyway, uh, the two countries' cases are uh, worth look at uh, with a perspective of late comma seriously. My point here as seriously is it is interesting to study whether or not the two countries are following the same path with other uh, OECD countries, uh, but it may be even more interesting to understand the relevance of such activities as followers. Particularly, my central question in this regard is why didn't Japan or South Korea learn the lesson from European countries and decided to launch a bold or um, unprecedented, by Erin's words, um, policy reform, um, despite the fact that the both countries knew that European countries and perhaps the, the states, Australia and other OECD countries, have partially uh, failed uh, in uh, introducing uh, such kind of open migration policy. So that's my point. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, so uh, in this regard, I'm, I'm going to talk on two points. First, I'd like to talk about what I call as unintended policy convergence. That's uh, some, uh, some, uh, some parts uh, resonates is, uh, with Erin's uh, argument. Um, and again, I repeat why Japan and Korea are following the same path with European countries in particular, in spite of the fact that the public is already aware that European countries are facing problems. And second, I will talk on the possible consequences as challenges on social inclusion. First, as of uh, policy convergence, I would focus on the immigration policy reform uh, that took place last year, um, as Erina mentioned. And it would be fair to say that this reform is a drastic one in a sense that it is, um, as Erin said again, it is widely accepted that Japan has explicitly and directly opened its door uh, for labor migration, in particular for de facto unskilled, work, uh, unskilled workers. Mm -hmm. And um, I take it as an event that took place all of a sudden, you know, not, not like, you know, as Erin re regarded as a kind of a result of a gradual um, process. Of course, um, Erin is right in her saying that uh, there has been the aging society problem as a structural factor, and it was already there for more than uh, 20 years ago, I would say, and the situation became more serious and it was recognized in 2016 when the official data showed the net decrease of the population for the first time since 1920 when the Japanese government started censoring. Also in terms of the working population, the labor force participating rates uh, was 60.0% altogether, and it is estimated that 8.6% of the non-participating population is willing to work if they can, and the two-thirds of which is a woman. And um, I just uh, made a brief uh, graph of this. Uh, this is um, the graph uh, that uh, illustrates the, uh, the relation between the active opening ratio and the unemployment rate. Uh, the, uh, on the, uh, the first axis is the active opening ratio, and the, and the, the, the right one is an unemployment rate. So um, as you see, um, uh, they are uh, after the bubble burst, and you know there is another uh, uh, economic downturn uh, because of the Lehman shock. Uh, there was a kind of you know, up and downs on the unemployment rate, and, and in how I would say correlation to that, you know, when the uh, unemployment is going down, the uh, the uh, active opening ratio, both for sorry for the Japanese written here, uh, the, the the blue one is uh, for a fixed term worker, and the re uh, red one is for uh, sorry, uh, blue one is for full time worker, and the red one is for fixed time workers. But anyway, uh, the, uh, the the demand uh, for both labors uh, is going up. 
So um, it is uh, not uh, uh, something new uh, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the correlation between these uh, uh, ratios, but I would say that you know, for the uh, the, the now is the time uh, in, J in, in, in Japan uh, that there's a strong uh, labor demand, right? And uh, um, as Erin said, you know, there are lots of structural factors that would facilitate Japan into open migration policy. So from that point of view, it is natural that Japan has made a drastic reform last year, but I still take it as a swift change of political stance by the government. And the reason is, um, even though there is a strong uh, labor demand, there are a kind of people who believe that kind of labor demand can be uh, fulfilled by the domestic labor force. Because people, some people uh, support the argument that more uh, female workers should be uh, participated into the society. And also, you know, uh, some people even think that AI, uh, in, uh, uh, I mean, the revolution is uh, helpful, that more robots are working instead of a human being. And even in, in the center of Tokyo, there is a hotel uh, totally run by robots, and uh, the hotel is called the Hotel Bizarre, and <laughs> it's a really bizarre <laughs> hotel. But anyway, so, you know, all kinds of, you know, the uh, industrial revolutions can be helpful for without the help of immigrants. So there are a bunch of people who, uh, um, uh, who believe that you know, immigrants is not needed even mm -hmm. under these circumstances. But still, you know, the situation changed and they just uh, wonder why. Right? Um, okay. And I would say that the, uh, maybe uh, we can explain the Japanese uh, drastic change of uh, uh, policy towards uh, uh, open immigration uh, with the logic by, um, again, the Gary Freeman, as uh, so many other people use it, uh, in his term of interest group politics, I would say. Uh, and possibly, uh, I mean, and, uh, and scholarly in Japanese cases, it is the uh, trade union, which is called Keidanren in Japanese, and combined with the Minister of Economics, Trade and Industry, and its agency, which is called the Small and Medium Enterprise Agency, all together has become a powerful interest group, which has succeeded to give a huge impact on the current administration of Shinzo Abe, uh, which is carrying out a pro-neoliberal policy, economic policy this, this time. Moreover, the relatively weak power of the labor union, uh, which is called Rengo, has facilitated this tendency. While the trade union is a powerful actor to determine open migration policy, it is salient that they don't show themselves to be fully responsible for social stability. So on theory, it is rather the task of labor union that uh, could represent the workers' right, um, regardless of their national background. However, Rengo seems to follow the traditional um, um, uh, um, uh, trade-related you know, labor markets model that tends to regard foreign labor force as a preventive factor to the wage growth in the labor market of the host country. And uh, that said, you know, it must be, uh, the, uh, the Rengo uh, cannot uh, s uh, remain to be naive and indifferent to the international tendency to protect workers' rights across borders. So in the end, Rengo is in the ambivalent position and eventually decreases the power in the decision-making process. And on top of that, uh, there is a kind of a power politics inside the House of Representatives that works quite well, because for the time being in Japanese House of Representatives, more than two-thirds of members, which is 313 uh, members, are uh, of ruling party. So uh, already there, there is a setting uh, that is favorable to, uh, favorable to the ruling party. But it's also worth noting that consensus was not initially made even inside the, uh, the leading party, which is uh, the Liberal Democratic Party and Kometo. So there are some people inside the ruling party which, is, which was against the idea of open migration. And what, did, uh, what the Abe administration did in collaboration with powerful business actors 
um, is, uh, in my words, you know, they deluded the public by using the uncertainty logic with optimistic interpretation and with the securitized logic in an economic sense that the rural area wouldn't survive without the help of migration. The government negates the new recru recruitment scheme for immigrants, as Chun said. Uh, the government uh, reiterates that the specified skill one, which is called tokute gino one category, is for fairly low-skilled and fixed-term workers, and they are not allowed to uh, bring their family. And they estimate the workers under this category would constitute the largest population because the other categories, including the new one, which is called specified skill two, require relatively higher skills. But they overlook or possibly bypassing the possibility that certain level of demand for foreign labor could continue, even though the unemployment rate of native exists or even raise at some point. As long as such a recruitment scheme could satisfy the trade union in terms of controlling the wage standard to meet their demand. So this is how Japan will follow the trend of what the other OECD countries have experienced in terms of re uh, receiving economic migrants. Okay. So moving on to the second point uh, on social inclusion. So as I said, the government is launching a comprehensive uh, social, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, the government uh, doesn't say that the, the new uh, reform is not an, a policy for immigrants, but still the government is launching a comprehensive social support policy. However, this is not uh, what, uh, you know, Erin was so kind in describing that the Japanese <laughs> reforms are so considerate in terms of social uh, support, but I really don't think that the government is so, so kind in terms of that. <laughs> Meaning that, you know, the government is not really um, uh, 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 committed to uh, the full care uh, of the immigrants, but the, their focus is more on the pull effects. Uh, in other words, the, these support measures are mainly to attract foreign nationals to choose Japan. But the government is not entirely concerned with the consequence and seems to stay away from taking responsibility for the full-fledged care to the local government in this regard. Um, I just talk about the local government because it's very important uh, in Japan because it's widely known that the 2018 and uh, last year for reform is basically to respond to the labor needs from the local societies where the majority of industries are small or medium-sized and many of them are facing a serious labor shortage. On the other hand, the central government acknowledges the fact that the freer movement inside Japan is needed to be guaranteed uh, for uh, those who want to come in order to attract more workers from outside. Because uh, we could uh, very easily expect that many of them uh, would move to such big cities as Tokyo once they are inside, the, uh, inside Japanese society. So the government is in, uh, therefore in a situation of a dilemma, so to speak, to deliver measures of offering and halting the free movement of foreign work workers at the same time. So the central government is trying to solve this problem, uh, but they can't do so for the time being, so they're just doing uh, uh, financial support to the local government. So I really don't think it is uh, uh, satisfactory measures uh, to uh, meet the goal. So in any case, it would be too optimistic to see the successful migration uh, management inside Japan is achievable only by such redistributive measure. In addition to that, the problem is much deeper rooted than expected because the solution mechanism wouldn't work even if problems are detected. The structural deficiencies lie in here. Um, like um, Erin said, the there is a discrimination in the workplace and there's a, a victimized a people uh, of, uh, by, uh, in the black labor market, so to speak, and the poverty, and also disres disrespect of human rights. These are all what foreign workers could experience and they did experience in, their, in, in, in Japan or possibly in Korea, but arguably these are also what the native workers in Japan and possibly in Korea uh, share, you know, could encounter in their daily life as well. So the political actor should consider these issues as the whole nation's problem, but in reality, it is more likely to be regarded as problems only non-national residents are facing when we follow the Olson's logic of collective action. 
So it is possible that the decentralized native workers are more likely to be left out, and that could become an additional source of instability to society. So on this point, although the lack of political mechanism is uh, witnessed in every country, including Japan, Korea, and maybe possibly the EU member states, the Japanese case can be more serious when we recall what happened a few days ago that the Keidan Ren, the trade union, abstained from the ILO legislation to combat harassment in the workplace. So I stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um,